What's up, survivors? This is Veduy42, and I'm back with another server admin guide for you. I'm going to be focusing specifically on how to better admin and manage your hosted server. In my case, on Pink Perfect. Though, if you're using another provider that's also using the cPanel and stuff like that, it'll be very similar. If you don't have a server and was looking for one, check out the video description below where I will be linking a video of how to get it set up, as well as my affiliate link and the discount code for 10% recurring off every month hell of a deal there is a lot to cover so let's dive right into it right after you hit that like button and subscribe and ring the notification bell no no just kidding only do that if you find it useful but make sure you do it if you ever wanted to run a kinjin or nitrogen map on a server i'm going to tell you how to do that too so stay tuned so we're here at the main page and i will be covering configuration files well, and why these are important. Of course, mod manager, file manager, log viewer, update from Steam, we should be, here we go, this one very important, backup and restore, backup world and restore world, super important. And we're also going to be looking at scheduled tasks, which can make your life a lot easier when it comes to taking backups and restarting stuff like that. And of course, the last item I'm going to go through is how to run a pre-generated map, such as Nitrogen or King Gen, on a hosted server. So there is a lot to get through. I will put chapters in the video description if you need to bounce around a bit, and that allows you to go back and forth when you want to look at something specific. But first off, let's look at configuration files. And don't worry about the IP and stuff like that. This is actually a test server that I have set up just to know to show this to you so you don't have to worry about trying to log in because it's not going to work. Oh, by the way, the video in the background is my Undead Legacy mod pack, which actually ironically, or maybe not ironic at all, I'm actually running Undead Le Legacy on my Pink Perfect server. So that works out pretty well. So configuration file. Let's click here and we'll see a bunch of them. We have the pinkperfect.xml, which is really the server config.xml, which has all the server settings. They do have a caveat here that says, do not change the telnet password while the server is running. It also has the web permissions, ping admin, which is the server admin.xml, and some specific for Twitch integration. I'm not going to go into those, however, right now. So first one, configuration editor. This is really important to go through. This is where you specify for one, which version you want to have, which is generally going to be the later ones, 19.5 where they're going to have a private game, your password, things like, uh, let's say, which map you're going to be using. And I will go through this a little bit later uh, in regards to using a pre-generated map. If you're going to have a random world, you type in RWG, the size, the game name, difficulty, all these basic things for how you want the server actually to operate. So go through all these ones. There's a lot of information here. There are some tool tips for some of them that will give you some information of actually what they do something like this you know blood moon frequency if you don't know specifically what they do there are some resources and i'll try to link that in the description for explaining all these in a little bit more detail because there's quite a few settings normally default ones work pretty well you might want to change some when it comes to for instance how many zombies don't take it too high how uh, for instance xp gain if you want to look at loot respawn you do that, that here as well so basically it's the game in-game settings that you change here once you're done basically you do a save the second one, webpermission.xml. This one specifically relates to Alex server fixes, which actually comes with a web map, which is really, really convenient, actually, if you're running a server, because people can actually see it, what the map is, how it looks, what's been explored, and even where some players are. This is where you configure the levels of permission that is required in order to access something for instance log in normally you know 2000 if you want to be able to allow people to see how uh, who is online you can do that as well just by on commenting things and everything you know check it check that out if you've never used a web map this is something that i actually recommend doing if you're running a server because it makes it a little bit more convenient for the player to access just to make whatever changes you want to have and save i'm going to cancel because i didn't make anything now ping admin is another really really important it's really just a fancy name for the server admin XML. The reason they call them differently is because they have some UI interfaces that allows you to make change. For instance, if you do configuration editor, you are able to, for instance, put in 
the Steam ID and stuff like that. If you want to add admins and whitelists and stuff like that, I'm going to go through just the text editor because that's what I'm used to, but that's why they changed the name. So this is where you have all the permissions for entering. For instance, if you want to set yourself as an admin, this is where you actually have to make sure that you do that. You have to put in yourself as an admin. Otherwise, you don't have admin access to your own server. You can also change the permission level of some of the commands. Like see all these ones require zero one, which is basically admin level. Thousand is for normal player login, which means that you can change things that, you know, if you want people to be able to teleport, you can change that so normal players can do that, for instance. We also come to things like whitelisting and blacklisting. And whitelisting is done in two different ways. One is to simply put in a Steam ID, and this is the Steam 64 ID. Make sure you're uncommented as well. This allows you to whitelist individual players so that they can access your server. There's also a really cool way of doing this, which is by a group Steam ID. This allows you to have a Steam group that when people uh, join it, they will automatically gain access to your server. I personally use this because it's a lot simpler. I have a Steam group for my community server where people, they apply to join. I will then let them in once I know who they are and I actually can talk to them in Discord because they have to be part of my Discord. And once I've let them into the group in Steam through the Steam UI, they can access the servers. I don't have to go and add them here in the game itself. What happens is that the game will go to the Steam ID of the group. They will check to see if the player is actually a member of that group. If it is, it will let them in. So that makes whitelisting a lot easier. Blacklisting is something I don't use very often, but it's something that can be fairly useful if you're having some of this, let's say they're causing problems or they're hacking or something, and you want to blacklist a specific person. I normally have whitelisting plus a password, which has generally been enough for me. But if you run an open server, you might want to have to simply use the blacklist if you want to ban specific players. Now the next one is going to look at the mod manager, which is a super easy way to install both mods and mod packs. So in this case, we're going to go to alpha 19 mods and let's say I want to have, where's Alex? I usually put in Alex server fixes, which is a really, really good way of having some additional things such as the web map. All you do is click and you will get to the install where the server will actually install it for you. Really convenient. Same thing, once it's been done, you can uninstall it here as well. And that's for individual mods that might be in the list. Uh, there are some combo packs, there are some deep pockets, there are even you know, some different huts and stuff like that. If you wanna have full mod packs, that can be done as well, which is actually very convenient. If you want to run a mod pack server, for instance, all you do is expand the group and you'll see a bunch of the different mods. You'll have Ravenhurst, Romero mod, Apocalypse Now, there's gonna be Darkness Falls, Sorcery, JNA mod, Undead Legacy, which is what I'm running currently right now, Walk the Walk and stuff like that. All you do is like any mod here, it install. There might be some other specifics. We're looking for instance at uh, under legacy. It says that disable ESC in the ping perfect or XML config if you want to play this mod, so make sure you follow that as well. There's also sometimes a mention about this mod may require a RAM upgrade. Reason being a lot of mod packs are a lot heavier on both client and server because they have so much more assets, which means that you might have to put on one, two, three gigabytes extra of RAM in order to run it smoothly. You can try it out uh, without adding any RAM and you'll be able to see uh, how it's running at the moment because it will actually tell you what the memory is uh, currently in use. If it goes to a high, the system will shut it down your server and restart it and you'll know that it's not gonna work. So just try it out first and just look at how much memory is using, but it's a really easy way of installing a mod pack. Coming to the file manager. It's a really easy way to access your files, your saves and mods and so on. Normally what I use it for is to upload my own small mods. All you need to do is navigate to the mods folder. You'll, and here you'll see install the analog server mods. And all you need to do is basically just hit upload and upload your own mods. Let's say you've gone to nexus.mods, you have a small mod that says uh, video is wireless power box. All you do is upload it, unzip it, and it should all work fine. And you can do that for a lot of small, uh, small mods. If the mod is too big, 
the file manager will not be able to handle. I think the limit is something like 10 megabyte. If that's the case, you might have to FTP things here instead. Now, uh, going through FTP is a little bit out of scope for, for this video, but it's also a very good way if you want to access the files. But if you just want to do minor things, let's say you want to check to see your saves and everything, you want to see what you have, uh, your generated worlds and everything, the file manager is super easy. If you do need to FTP, the actual port and the IP will be here. And if you've never used FTP, just Google it and uh, go read up on it and download a client. If you've used it, then well, it should be fairly straightforward. FTP is the way that I normally, if I want to upload a, a generated world, I will use that because those one can be hundreds of megabyte. If I want to download a save or download something that is large, usually I'll be using FTP. Now we've come to Log Viewer, and that's a super useful tool for figuring out what the heck is going on here. Let's say you have been uh, starting a server and you've run into some issues, or maybe you just want to see that the server is running properly. All you do is download a stream, you'll get an output log saying, hey, you know, here is the file and everything, and you'll be able to then see what's happening. What you're normally looking for, this will, uh, if you look at the bottom, you're looking for something like this, where it says that game server in it is successful and start game is done. If you get to this point, you'll know that the server started up properly. You can also see, you know, this was a Navis game. This is just a save and everything and survival and some of the specific pieces in there. If there's any errors, you generally don't get to this. There'll be errors up here. Warnings don't have to worry about. It just means that something wasn't loading over and checked if there was a specific library. And like I said, this one has no Voltex shader, which doesn't matter. If it doesn't work, normally you'll see an error and it'll stop processing the rest and then you won't get this start game done and game server in is successful and that gives you some information that you can uh, track down what the issues is. maybe you malform one of the configs when you were editing it and you have to refresh it and make sure that you fix that error now that there are two ways to update your server one is update your server from steam and that's generally what you do let's say you are in 19.6 and you want to go to 19.7, or assuming there is a 19.7, you simply run Steam Update. What it will do, it will connect to Steam, it will download the latest version, and it will install it. Really simple. But that's for the official updates. That only works when it's a when it's an official stable update. If you want to do a beta update, you can do that as well. This one is slightly different. Let's say you want to have an experimental version, that will work. If there was, let's say, a 19.7 experimental, you would do a latest experimental. Let's say you the one alpha 20 is coming experimental, you do a latest experimental and it will give you that version. But hey, let's say you want to run an alpha oh, 11.6 version. You can actually do that. That way, the hosted server provider will have the system download 11.6, install that, and you can actually play an earlier version of the game as well. This can be super useful. Let's say you're using a mod pack that only works on alpha 19.5. You can actually specify 19.5, get that version installed on the hosted provider, then install your mod pack and all that and everything will work fine. I usually use this one when I'm trying out the experimental or if I have some issues with the upgrade. For instance, I was using under legacy 19.5. I tried to upgrade to 19.6. There was a bunch of incompatibility. I had to downgrade again to 19.5, reinstall the mod in order to continue with my old save. So it's a very, very useful functionality to be aware of, even though you might not use it very often. Now, item six we're going to be covering is backup and restore. I seriously suggest that you use these ones frequently. As we all know, games can corrupt. You can lose characters. You can have weird effects happening. You can have chunks being re reset or regions lost. A backup every day, every other day, once a week can save you from raging if something goes wrong. Now it's fairly self-explanatory. Backup will take a world save backup. You click it and it'll say, yes, if you're gonna do a backup, restore is basically restoring a backup that you have. Now I haven't made any because this is just a test server. Otherwise it'll be in this list. Really simple. And it's a way to roll back in case that, hey, you know, you log in today, something went wrong, stop the server, do restore world and you can then restore back to a previous backup. If you don't have any backups, you can't do this. So 
I would definitely suggest that you do this frequently. If you have an open server where people might be griefing, without a backup, you can't roll back. Let's say someone comes in, uh, you know, this morning, they griefed the server, destroyed all this stuff. If you have a backup, you can just roll back to it. Very, very convenient. The last thing I'm going to cover, actually, it's not the last one, almost the last one, is going to be the scheduled tasks. A scheduled task is basically a, a job an action that the hosted server is taking at a specific date, specific time, running a specific command. And you might be thinking, what are you talking about? Well, very useful ones is for instance, to have a daily restart. As we know, a lot of game servers and seven days die is not different in that sense, has some memory leaks. There can be peculiarities that are exp uh, running up. The RAM is being hogged somewhere and it's not running very well. Having a restart every day, is very useful because it just clears everything out, restarts it, and the game is good to go from a fresh start. Not a fresh save, but from a fresh load-in. And doing that manually is very inconvenient. What you can do is basically say, hey, I'm gonna do a scheduled restart at, let's say, 3 a.m., 4 a.m. or something, when no one is likely to be playing. So all you do is schedule a restart, hit new, and you can name it, you can tell you're gonna do one time, daily, weekly, and if you do weekly, which days are you gonna do? Let's say Monday, Wednesday, uh, Saturday, and Sunday, and basically just say, yes, I'm gonna have a restart at this time, on these days, and that's what it's gonna do. It's super convenient to do it that way. Another thing that you will probably wanna do is to back up the world. Having to go in manually and backing things up is inconvenient. Same thing as the restart, do a new, and then basically say, hey, you know, I'm gonna do this on a daily basis, and then use actually not daily, weekly basis. I'm gonna do a backup on Tuesday, Thursdays, and Saturday. And I'm gonna do this at, you know, whatever time and date that you wanna have, let's say at 5 a.m. or something. Very simple, and that way you don't have to worry about making the backups yourself. The system is making them for you. If you don't use this one to make backups, you do risk having to log in every day, every other day to trigger it yourself, and that's not very convenient. <laughs> Another useful thing that you probably will only be using very rarely is, is actions. This allows you to, well, stop server is the usual one, but reinstalling this, this server from scratch. Let's say you have installed and run Darkness Falls. Everything has been going great, but you want to install Undead Legacy. Now, removing the, the, the game, removing all the saves is very inconvenient because there might still be some lingering you know, DLLs and other changes in there that you don't want to worry about because uninstalling a mod pack doesn't necessarily undo all the damage that is actually made to the install because it overwrites some files. What you then do is go to actions and reinstall. I'm not going to do that here, but it basically allows you to reinstall just like the first install that you actually got a mail about saying that, hey, your service is now installed and ready for you to access. This is effectively the same thing. It will start a background job from the server host, which will wipe everything you have, your saves, your worlds and everything. And regular backup is not gonna help because it's gonna wipe everything clean. It's gonna be a fresh instance. And it will then tell you when it's done. In my case, it takes just a few minutes usually. And you can go back into the server at just like it was a fresh server that you ordered. Normally I do that when I'm switching mod packs or if I mess everything up and I just can't get it to work, maybe I messed up a configuration file or something, reinstalling it that way is one way to recover, assuming you don't have any saves and everything that you care about. Finally, finally, we've come to how do you upload and host a map that you have generated outside of the game? Let's say you've used Nitrogen, KingGen, how do you actually use that specific map in the game? Well, there are two things that you need to do. Firstly, you need to get your generated worlds map that you've generated uploaded. Now, you can't do that in the file menu. You have to do that in FTP. So go figure out how FTP works. What you basically need to do, if the folder is not already created, create the folder called generated worlds. Here, you then need to upload your world that you've generated in KingGen. It's pretty straightforward if you know how to, how to generate it in KingGen. It gives you a folder structure with a bunch of files. Upload that here under the generated worlds. That's step number one. You need to do that. Do that through FTP because generally it's not going to work through the upload uh, file manager because the files are too big. Like, you know, it can be hundreds of megabytes. That's the first thing. Second thing you want to do 
is go to configuration files. We're going to go to the editor and we're going to open that up. And there's basically just one thing you want to do here. You want to go to the game world. What this system does here when you put Navis game, it's actually using a pre-generated world. If you put pre-gen pre-gen 01, it's doing the same thing. It's picking up a pre-generated world that is part of the game. And that's exactly what you want to do yourself. So in my case, mine was called VET2. That's it. It was a 1496 size. That's it. The C doesn't matter. That's whatever I want to be. Game name doesn't matter. It's important that the game world is called the exact same as you generated in Kingen or Nitrogen and just make sure the size is the same if you generated. That's it. That's all you have to do. Then you just save it and you're good to go. Coming back to this main page, there are some other things that you might care about. For instance, backing up the config, it will, will back up everything you've like your ping admin and all that can be useful if you have a long standing server that you want to make sure that you don't mess it up uh, before you make some specific tweaks can be useful. And of course, restoring it. If you are trying to check what your telnet ports are, if you want to ban something, IP addresses, stuff like that, there's a bunch here. Going to the wiki, very super useful as well. Just click that and it'll bring you over to the wiki, which allows you to check a bunch of things and make sure you check out this beginner 21 tips and tricks. Someone has actually added that video, which happens to be mine, but we 42 as you can see. I I didn't add this myself. Someone did that. Thank you very much, whoever it was. And the wiki is, even though the wiki can be outdated, it actually has a lot of good information as well. The reason it's outdated often is because we're going through so many version changes with so many changes to how the game functions. But it's a good a good way to access it. If you want to check the, for instance, the admin comments, you can go here as well. Very useful if you want to figure out how to do that in game. Also a long, nice list. And there's some other things in there. Just explore it, etc. Don't be afraid there's very few things you can actually mess up unless you're editing files and and trashing it or something so it's always good to try things out play around with it learn how it works are you exhausted yet i hope you've got the strength to hit that thumbs up and subscribe so that you can catch me next time hopefully this has been useful but good luck special thanks to the great patrons supporting the channel if you would like to join the vetted community and support these videos do follow the patreon link